en protestsångare i USA på 40- och 50-talet skrev otroligt samhällskritiska texter mot ja, USAs sätt att sköta sina invånare. Eh, han är också egentligen känd som den första singer-songwritern och startade hela den här traditionen. Man kan säga att hade det inte varit för Woody Guthrie så hade vi inte haft artister som ja, Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, The Clash, Arnie DeFranco får nämna några stycken. Woody Guthrie dog i slutet av 60-talet. Väldigt tragiskt efter en lång tids sjukdom och efter sig så lämnade han tusentals låtar som finns i ett arkiv i New York. Problemet är bara att det inte finns någon musik till de här låtarna utan det är bara texterna som ligger där prydligt uppradade, vers och refäng. Men Nora Guthrie, Woody Guthries dotter som handlar om det här arkivet, hon tog tag i den här saken så hon kontaktade den engelska punkrockaren Billy Bragg som också var en protestångare i England på 80-talet. Kontaktade honom och frågade om han ville skriva musik till texterna. Det ville han givetvis, han blev jättesmickrad. Så han i sin tur kontaktade också amerikanska bandet Wilco. Och tillsammans så gjorde de två stycken skivor som heter Mermaid Avenue som kom ut för ett tag sedan. I måndags så fick vi tillfälle att hälsa på Billy Bragg i hans hemstad utanför Dorchester på engelska sydkusten. Och då pratade vi givetvis om hur det var det där att skriva musik till sina idolers idol. I'm gonna tell all you fascists you may be surprised people all over this world are getting organized you're bound to lose you fascists are bound to lose race hatred cannot stop us this one thing i know your poll tax and jim crow and greed have got to go you're bound to lose why do you think that Nora puts you with the you know the position of right well this is a question I've heard Nora I've been present in interviews when Nora's attempted to answer this but she never really gets to grips with it she just says well you know it's obvious or she talks about my music and stuff like that but um, I, have a, I have a personal theory in that um, the the way i approach my music uh, although it's political i don't approach it in a completely um uh serious manner i do i accept that that politics are um mostly compromise uh, and that um that really the 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 way to change the world is is through humanity rather than ideology and i think that's that was something that was very important uh, to woody he wasn't really a dogmatist or he didn't believe in any one ideology, he believed in people. And um, maybe there's a resonance in what I was doing um, uh, with my music that Nora found uh, with her father's music, maybe. The way you were saying and not what were you saying as well. Yeah, exactly. People of every colour marching side by side Marching across the fields where a million fascists died You're bound to lose Fascists about to lose. I've gone into this battle, take my union gun. I end this world of slavery for this battle's one you're bound to lose. You fascists about to lose. All of you fascists are bound to lose. You fascists are bound to lose. You fascists are bound to lose. You're bound to lose. You fascists are bound to lose. I said, all of you fascists are bound to lose. You fascists are bound to lose. You fascists are bound to lose. You're bound to lose. You fascists are bound to lose. My first feelings were that this, this is a job that could really turn, uh, uh, go upside down on you, you know, and turn out really bad. Um, I, th I thought that perhaps it was not my job, but Bob Dylan's job. <clears throat> and that... Uh, what, that you were not worthy? Or? No, not that I wasn't worthy. I just didn't know enough about Woody Guthrie. Okay. You know, I, I, was, I was someone who, like I'm sure many of your viewers, uh, learned about Woody Guthrie from learning about Bob Dylan and that generation of songwriters. Um, I knew who Woody Guthrie was, I knew why he was important, but I didn't know the details of his life and his, his, um, all of his material. Um, and also, uh, I was not an American. 
And that, was, that concerned me a bit, that this guy was an American icon and I was actually a European. This land is your land, and this land is my land. When you were in Oklahoma, you yeah. were in his hometown, what went through your head there when you were standing there walking his footsteps? Where am I going to get a decent cappuccino? <laughs> was that the only thing? <laughs> no, but that's the thing I most remember when you asked me that question. Okay. What was going through my mind? Let me mind? rephrase it, seeing what you <laughs> There was no, there was like, I just need a coffee. There was nowhere, there was nowhere. <laughs> we went to, out onto the old Route 66 to some terrible, terrible, Diner, you know, a real kind of like, well, what do you want kind of place. Mm -hmm. Coffee. The worst coffee. So anyway. <laughs> so let me rephrase it. If you okay, see like yeah. the, the home of Woody Guthrie yes. written, written on the water on the, sustainer yeah, yeah. and stuff like yeah. that. So how did it affect you? Well, was it, what you it was, it, to me, it was very, very interesting to go to Okima because we, we, uh, we drove there from, uh, from uh, I think we'd been in Pittsburgh. It took us three or four days. And I took that opportunity to read uh, the Joe Klein biography of Woody Guthrie, which is the, the standard work. Um, so that journey, I kind of like submerged myself into Woody. We also went to uh, um, to Pampa in Texas, where he wrote the Dust Bowl and saw the, the great dust bowl, uh, storms there. There's a black wind blowing in the cotton field, honey. There's a black wind blowing in the cotton field, baby. There's a black wind blowing in the cotton field. Oh, how funny it makes me feel, baby. Sweet thing, darling. There's a long black cloud hanging in the sky, honey. There's a long black cloud hanging in the sky, baby. There's a long black cloud hanging in the sky. Weather's gonna break and hell's gonna fly, baby. Sweet thing, darling. Cotton's pretty thin yonder on the hill, honey. Cotton's pretty thin yonder on the hill, baby. Cotton's pretty thin yonder on the hill, it won't clear a greenback dollar bill, baby. Sweet thing, darling. There's a black wind blowing in the cotton field, honey. There's a black wind blowing in the cotton Field, baby, there's a black wind blowing in the cotton field, and oh, how funny it makes me feel, baby, sweet thing, darling. Woody came to New York at a time when a, when a group of folk singers uh, were. Although they'd all been nice college kids like Pete Seeger and, uh, and, and, and those men and women, they were in the Almanac Singers. They were all very good college kids, you know, white bread college kids. They had been inspired by the idea of American folk music and radicalism. And they were kind of trying to construct their own radical songs. And then one day, in walks Woody Guthrie, covered in dust, singing This Land Is Your Land. It must have blown their minds. It must have blown them up. It must have been like hearing Jimi Hendrix for the first time when you're Eric Clapton and thinking, oh my God, you know, everything I thought I knew is wrong, you know. I roamed and rambled and I followed my footsteps. He was the last, perhaps, of that European minstrel tradition, traveling minstrel. He was the very last one of those. But he was also, and this is the great irony with Woody Guthrie, he was also the first punk rocker. He was an alternative musician. Almost every song he wrote was an, as an alternative to something that he heard on the radio that he, he didn't agree with. This Land Is Your Land was a response to a song called God Bless America by Irving Berlin, which was a huge number one chart hit 
in 1939, 1940. Everywhere Woody went on the jukebox, this damn song was playing, and he wrote a song called God Blessed America for Me, which he subsequently changed to This Land is Made for You and Me. He was an alternative musician of the, of the very first order. It's against the law to walk, against the law to talk, it's against the law to loaf, against the law to work, it's against the law to read, against the law to write, it's against the law to be black or brown or white. Everything's against the law I'm a low-paid daddy singing the high price blues It's against the law to eat Against the law to drink Against the law to worry it's against the law to think It's against the law to marry Or try to settle down It's against the law to ramble Like a bum from town to town Everything's against the law I'm a low-paid daddy Singing the high price blue Against the law to roll, against the law to hug, against the law to kiss, it's against the law to shoot, against the law to miss. Everything's against the law. I'm a low paid daddy singing the high price blue. Life in He's New in York. This, yeah. There's all the family there. Look. There's Will here. Yeah. There. My body position had a rhythm which, if counted according to accents, would be the setup for pieces of cheese on a board. Chess. Pieces of chess. <laughs> <laughs> so, what were you feeling when you stood there? What went through your head when you stood in the archive getting your hands on those yeah. songs? Well, I mean, this is the clever thing. In the letter that I, I spoke about, Nora sent some photocopies of some of the lyrics, and I saw immediately that what she was talking about was not fragments of songs, but complete songs. And they were good songs. They were interesting songs. They were kind of all there. What were your expectations of it, though? Well, <clears throat> my expectations were that, that the songs would be fragmentary and there would be very few of them, that I was being called in to, to you know, to bring to life the last few fragments of Woody. Actually, completely the opposite is true. Um, I was being asked to be the first person to sort of put my head under the water and look at the rest of the iceberg of his work because the songs that we have all heard and the songs he recorded in his lifetime, on which his legend is based, represent less than 10% of the songs that he personally wrote in his lifetime. 90% of the songs he wrote, we've still never heard. I mean, Mermaid Avenue has only chipped away at the, at the, uh, the two, nearly 3,000 songs that are in the archive. Yeah. You can look for the first line of the yeah. song, a genre of the yeah. song, a uh, type script, whether, yeah. you know, whether it's um, typed or hand manuscript. I don't know if this will help you. I need to cast my eye over. I wish it wasn't me. 318 songs in those 12 notebooks. I know. I'm going to have a chance to go through all of them today. But, right. but just looking at the books like that also gives me a bit of a vibe. You know, it just it just all helps. I'm sort of, I think I've, they're pulling songs. I'm, I'm, you know, there's going to be some songs I really like that probably aren't going to make it into the project even. I can't think of another work, uh, another artist rather of the stature and importance of Woody Guthrie, whether it's in pop music, in art, in anything, of whom 90% of his 
um, or her work still remains to be appreciated. You know, imagine they found, you know, 90% more Picassos somewhere. What would it tell us about Picasso? Or, or uh, you know, they, they suddenly discovered, um, uh, you know, 90% more Alfred Hitchcock films. You know, it would, everybody would want to see it. Everyone would want to see what that was. And, and with Woody, that's, the, that's, that's what's out there. This voice is still not been heard. And until it has been, those, until those, those ideas of, of Woody's have been heard and appreciated in some way, Take then he still has a lot to, to tell us. Of just this size I could write about her Because I felt if I could know her I could know all women I was being asked to be um, the first person to, to, to see if, if um, I guess, if, if we blew on these songs, would they come back to life, I guess. And to my joy, these songs, it was like watering a, a seed, these songs. It was all there. All I had to do was just put a little bit of water on them and just pad them in the ground, and they just... in the wind and beckoned me back to living and her thoughts were more my thoughts and I listened more to myself what could I ever give except myself to pay her for salvaging my wreck? But I must not talk hopeless because it is hope I'm sure that she loves in me. She has sown in a ground I thought rotten on a hill I thought was eroded. These are my new hopes now to work clearer, faster and better. This is written so you won't underestimate the value of your women because they run the men that run the world how did you go about it creatively handling the song since you know the formalized set the verse and the chorus yeah. are there <clears throat> how was that working well that helps because um, obviously um, a song that has had music written to it and Almost all of these songs, um, if you look at the manuscripts, would say words and music by Woody Guthrie. Woody definitely wrote music for these, uh, these songs, but he kept the music in his head. He didn't r write music. I don't write music. You know, if, my, if you took all of my papers um, for the songs of all my albums, all you would have is manuscripts. You would have no music. You'd have to buy the CD to find out how the tunes go. Um, so the fact that they did have uh, a tune um, gives the song itself an internal rhythm. Uh, it, um, it has a, a meter to it, it scans, although not always in the way you would think with Woody Guthrie, slightly lopsided. But um, you, you'd already get a, a, a flavour of that. And then what you would do is you would try to make some music that was sympathetic to the idea being expressed in the song. If it was a powerful song, political song, you would choose a powerful tune. If it was a, uh, perhaps a song that was reflective, you would choose choose something like that. So there were clues there. Ten hundred books of just this size I could write you about her Because I felt if I could know her I could know all women But what about the quality? Mm. Did you have any expectations or letdowns in that department? Well, it, it was hard. I, I suppose I, I went in um, w with my idea of what, what Woody Guthrie, who Woody Guthrie was, 
And then the first, uh, what I remember was the first day <coughs> while I was going through the A's, I would pull out if I thought there's a good Woody Guthrie th song. So by the end of the first hour, I had this pile of good Woody Guthrie songs. I thought, this is stupid. So I think I should pull out the ones that are really exceptional Woody Guthrie songs. So I started doing that, and that just piled up too. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to pull out the ones that are absolutely out there. And that's when I started getting through to Ingrid Bergman, my flying saucer, the real beyond Woody song. My flying saucer, where can you be? Since that sad night that you sailed away from me. My flying saucer, I pray this night you will sail back before the day gets bright. Kiss away my tears My flying saucer I pray this night You will sail back Before the day gets bright Sail back before the day gets bright. So, how has your view of him and your relationship towards him changed, mm. you think, in a kind of short term? In the since... Well, before, um, I, felt, I felt that I was um, part of a tradition of which Woody Guffrey was the father. Singer-songwriter a... first. Well, yeah. yeah, there's a line that goes from me to The Clash. Um, they were a great inspiration to me. Uh, the lead singer of The Clash, Joe Strummer, before he called himself Joe Strummer, called himself Woody. He was hugely influenced by Woody Guthrie. Beyond that, the other great influence on me has been Bob Dylan. So again, that line goes back, and many other singer-songwriters of that period. And that, that we are links in the chain. There will be other songwriters out there who are inspired by me in the clash with Dylan. In the end, it all goes back to this big spike in the ground, and that big spike in the ground is, is Woody Guthrie for but our tradition. But how has it changed now, you think, now since it's you changed. worked with him? Now it's changed that um, I now have, as part of my job, the responsibility to try and invoke this man that I have um, collaborated with in the archive. I've been in the archive, and unfortunately you haven't. So, and, your, and your viewers haven't. Now, the, and this is the genius of Nora Guthrie. She could either wait till your viewers in Sweden had the opportunity to come to New York City and go into the room and put on the white gloves and have a look, or she could hire someone like me and Wilco to come along and to make an album so that your, your viewers in Sweden could drive in their car and listen to um, you know, uh, uh, California stars on the radio. That's the genius of Nora, you see. She's, I, I'm trying to... Uh, to um, you know, represent Woody and articulate Woody and, and, and uh, put that new angle onto Woody Guthrie. But Nora um, is the guardian of this, this, uh, this incredible legacy and she's con continually looking for ways to, to, to get that voice heard so that people's idea of Woody Guthrie continues to broaden rather than narrow down to a few things like this land is your land and, and uh, the Dust Bowl. <laughs> Why 
I will go. Mm -hmm. And what happened? Because yeah. we figured it happened something in the recording yeah. studio and yeah. afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, why Wilco um, is, is pretty straightforward. Um, I had a lot of respect for Jeff Tweedy when he was in a band called Uncle Tupelo. Um, and I, I saw in him someone whose idea of roots went beyond the 1950s. A lot of American roots bands, they're only really talking about the 50s. They're talking about rock and roll, R&B, soul. Jeff Tweedy's idea of roots was kind of the turn of the century. Woody Guthrie was born in 1912. That's the kind of place we were going to have to start from. And I knew enough about Jeff to know that if I could explain this project to him, he would realise the uniqueness of it. And he, he's a music fan, you know. It didn't matter, he wouldn't know a great deal about Woody. I would make it clear to him that that wasn't necessarily part of the deal. It was, does he want to collaborate? Not make a Woody Guthrie album, not, not cover Woody Guthrie, but collaborate. Uh, Hoodoo Voodoo, I wrote technically, but I think it should be Wilco Guthrie. I will go got three things since it totally transformed from the way I was playing it. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of a, a jam. It could be like Bragg, Wilco, got three, you know, because yep. we all did. Yeah, all that a bang. Everybody, mm. everybody take. Okay. We worked very, very well. At the, at the end of it, um, we, we had a, an agreement that um, I and my producer, Grant Showbiz, we would mix the songs that I wrote uh, the music for and that they would mix the songs that Jeff and Jay Bennett uh, wrote the music for and Wilco. And, and that was fine, but what happened was um, they, they began to, to ask if they could mix some of my songs. So I said, well, yeah, sure, you can, if you want to do it, because they were back in Chicago. Right now. If you want to do that, fine, but, you know, I'm happy with what I've got. I'll be happy to hear what you want to do and feel, f and please do it, you know, and I'll be very pleased to hear the results. But you have to understand that in the end, it's down, you know, the deal is down to me and my idea of how my song should sound, okay? So that was where the dispute sort of reared its ugly head. But that, that was just two guys were, who'd never had someone else co-produce a record with them. That's all it was. You know, we, in the end... You got together and... We resolved it, yeah. yeah. We got a resolution and we were all very proud uh, of, the, of the finished product. But, so you are but, on speaking terms and all that. Oh, yes, yeah. we're completely on speaking terms. <laughs> I'm kind of in the position now where I'm just um, re-emerging, I guess, as, um, a, uh, as Billy Bragg. I'm writing Billy Bragg songs again. And um, I, when the new album comes out, I guess I will, I will look at it and see if I can see in that um, decisive changes. It, it forced me to form a band to play these songs, a different kind of band. Uh, and the band that I've, I chose to, 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 to work with are very eclectic musicians. And the influence that they're bringing to my work now is much broader than I would normally have. So I think the experience of Mermaid Avenue, more than just Woody, the whole Mermaid Avenue experience, the making of the album, the, the, the way I have um, uh, promoted the album, that whole thing is, is bigger than just Woody now. It's kind of like it's got its own little uh, life, Mermaid Avenue, and, which is great. Um, and I think that... Uh, for me, I, at where I was before, at the age that I was, having been doing this job for, for such a long time, I, I was quite capable. I, was, I wouldn't run out of steam, but I would keep going in the same kind of direction. I think Mermaid Avenue has been a sabbatical. And better than that, it saved me having to write any songs about the Labour Party since Tony Blair became Prime Minister, which is so great. I can't tell you. <laughs> what a relief that's been for me. I can imagine. <laughs> Sometimes I think I'm gonna lose my mind But it don't look like I ever will I loved so many people everywhere I went Some too much Others not enough I don't know I may go
down or up or anywhere but I feel like this scribble will stay maybe if I hadn't seen so much hard feeling I might not could have felt other people's so when you think of me if and when you ever do just say well another man's done gone Another man's tongue gone. Mm, de är också lite lika, Billy Bragg och Woody Guthrie. När vi träffade Billy Bragg i måndag så pratade vi om så otroligt mycket mer än bara Woody Guthrie givetvis. Och han lät hälsa till alla sina svenska fans att han kommer till Stockholm i vår igen och spelar live för oss om han får som han vill. Vi kan också... Russell Watson, en